Welcome to In Search of the Divine. I'm Ann Thompson. We all take our turns going through the dark night of the soul, but today we're going to talk to people who have found that a little bit of faith, some hope, and some love can help navigate the way. Stay tuned. The National Institute of Mental Health claims an estimated 26.2% of Americans, ages 18 and older, about one in four adults, suffer from a diagnosable mental disorder in a given year. Today, we'll hear from people dealing directly and indirectly with biological brain disorders. Meet Donna. She's the program director at NAMI Minnesota. I'm a suicide survivor. My father died by suicide when I was very young. This is Ryan, an author and play-by-play -play announcer for Major League Baseball's Kansas City Royals. The best thing I probably did is that I realized I was depressed and I went at my recovery as a depressed person. Teresa lives in Minneapolis. It was at that point, a two month stay at the hospital that they figured out that I actually have bipolar. I'm living with bipolar. Anne and Michael are survivors of their daughter's suicide. Why couldn't God have done something to stop this? Teresa was an innocent girl. She, she never deserved anything like this. Teresa was 14 when she died. Amazing stories, and as we're about to learn, all part of the sacred journey through the dark night of the soul. I had my first suicidal thought at age five, so I've never known a life without mental illness. Didn't understand mental illness, didn't understand my symptoms or how to deal with them. And then when I was 20, 21, and I was going to school, I started feeling depressed and not sleeping well, sleeping too much, then not sleeping at all. She was diagnosed with major depression you know, a couple months earlier. Um, and so she was, she was dealing with that. This, this um, act that she did was definitely a result of what she was suffering on the internally. When you're depressed, you begin to feel as though, you know, you're the only one who could possibly have these feelings. And everyone around you is just having this great big party. You know, everyone's so happy. Everyone looks so much more happy and content. And so the, um, the anxiety really took over. I mean, I mean, it really took over where I, mean, I could barely get through the day. As is so often the case, our experiences lead to a fulcrum where the balance shifts. Everyone handles grief differently, but I would recommend when the hair on the back of your neck stands up and something doesn't seem right, it's time to talk to a doctor. And the hard part is the person who's involved can't always feel it. It, depression can be very insidious. It is insidious. It creeps up on you. I find myself in August of 2005 uh, in a closet in, a, in my bedroom in this house where I'm sitting right now, fetal position, just crying like a four, five, or six-year-old because that's when I really started to feel this detachment. I always had the wrong diagnosis because they never seen the manic part of me. They only saw the depressive side. So from 14 to 31, I was misdiagnosed. And that caused a lot of problems with my life. It was three years ago, November 1st, ironically, All Saints Day. Thought she had been napping, but she wasn't on her bed. And then I looked the other way, and there she was, not living. When I went up to um, the room <clears throat> to find out what was going on, um, I was just in shock what I saw. Um, Teresa was be being held by Anne. There was a ring around her neck and I thought that, I mean this, this ring was like so dark I thought it was like something was still on her neck but there wasn't anything on her neck and I felt it just to prove to myself that there was nothing there and there wasn't anything there. Suicide, I believe now they're saying, is the 10th uh, leading cause of death in this country. It is the third leading cause of death among young people. More on the spirituality of mental illness in a minute.
We've heard some pretty challenging journeys into mental illness, but as we're about to hear, there is a way through it. And I decided I was gonna go see my doctor. And that's where I kind of started the, the path to anti-anxiety medication, which I took for about four to six weeks until the antidepressants got into my system and, and really started to calm me down. Um, but that, that, that was the beginning of the process for me, just going to a doctor and telling a professional, hey, I think there's something wrong with me. And I remember my doctor just calmly said, well, let me give you a couple prescriptions. I mean, I thought they were gonna like, you know, um, tie me down to a chair and you know, wheel me out to the you know, middle of Kansas or something and just leave me there for the rest of my life. But he said, okay, well, okay, why don't you try this and this will, this will deal with these symptoms and then this drug should, you know, at some point take care of the both of them. And, and, um, and then I went, you know, I was starting to go to some counseling. And so I, I think, um, and then the people sharing their stories with me, I think I just started to see that even though it wasn't going to be easy, that, you know, maybe I will be okay. They've actually found that for people living with depression, peer-to-peer -peer support can be as effective as an antidepressant. It's really important to know that you're not alone. The year after I went through the depression, uh, a story was written about me in the Kansas City Star and what I had gone through. I started to talk to people and word spread and, well, I'm getting letters and cards from strangers. Thank you for sharing your story. I was going through the same thing. Thank you for being honest, you know. Thank you for being transparent. Um, you know, I feel a lot stronger now that I've read your story. Then I began to realize, well, you know, maybe, maybe this is a story that does need to be told. One of the things that we did as a family, we went to a grief support group on two separate occasions. A six week. A six week track. Um, and, our, and our kids just surprisingly really wanted to go to that. I thought they wouldn't want this at all. And they really liked that. And I think it, it helped them. Um, Helped, helped us. Um, and also, uh, we were, um, some of our kids since Teresa's death have, have been in some therapy too, um, mm -hmm. to, to, you know, to, to deal with it. Mm -hmm. um, so that's, that's an important component of the, of the healing, you know, as well. You know, it's kind of retraining your body, mind, and spirit to be in sync. Really try to work a lot on, on my spirituality and, um, and myself, and not just that, but how I treat others, and knowing what I know about my journey, and how everybody has that little spark of light in them. Even in the darkest of days, you have that bright light, that internal flame that keeps on going. And so, for me, that's important to remember that that flame is never Extinguished. If struggling through the vicissitudes of a brain disorder isn't enough on its own, there are cultural issues too. I do remember a sense of I was going to be exposed, you know, I was a failure, um, I was an imposter, somebody's going to um, see right through this facade I was trying to portray when I'd go to the ballpark every day and they would see that there was a scared little boy and I was going to lose my job and I was going to lose my car, I was going to lose my house, I was going to lose my friends, I was going to lose everything. And so there was just this, this fear that the world was just kind of crashing down on me. The stigma is very strong. The stigma is a huge roadblock for people in getting help. You know, you don't have to walk around with a billboard on your forehead that says, I'm living with bipolar or schizophrenia or what have you. But you can reach out to those resources that will support you and, you know, help you get a life worth living where you're wanted and, and your assets to the community are, are accepted and appreciated. Because we all want to feel like we're contributing to society. And sometimes, you know, you just get battered down so bad you don't think you can. But everybody has something to give to, to the world and, and the community and the little community and everything. Don't let people tell you or don't think that um, you're, you're abnormal or you're weird because or you don't want other people to know about the possibility of your child having a mental illness. We just have to remember the brain is part of the body. 
and the brain can get sick too. And there are treatments and there's help. The saddest thing is that the average person waits about 10 years after the onset of symptoms to get help. Despite it being 2013, there still is a stigma about mental illness, as if in some way a person could control that. You know, in my mind, it's, ju it's just as real as diabetes. Do we blame people for having diabetes? No. How about our heart condition? How about cancer? People kind of look down on you. There's a lot of stigma around that, and which is unfortunate because that keeps a lot of people from getting treatment. And we know that mental illness is treatable and suicide's preventable. While dealing with mental illness may not be culturally appreciated, it seems, at least with these sojourners, that the journey can bring about remarkable and insightful wisdom. The big lesson is never give up. That no matter how bad it gets, it'll always get better. And that you really gotta look at yourself and treat yourself with love and respect. Big lesson for me as a suicide survivor is that um, there's a lot of anger involved uh, when someone leaves you um, through a suicide and it can take a long time to get through that anger but it's certainly worthwhile because I finally got to a point where I couldn't be angry with an illness. Hopefully someday someone will be able to say, I don't know if this will happen. Yeah, I was just crying in my closet for an hour, so I think I'm going to go see a doctor. And then it won't be, you know, as there won't be a, the stigma attached to depression as there is now and as there was when I was going through what I was going through. If I were to talk to parents, I'd say, listen to your gut and you follow it. And another thing we've learned in our experience with mental illness is you have to be an advocate and you have to get out there and make it happen because there are so many loopholes in the uh, mental health system that pe people, I mean, people who are so vulnerable, they just, they just fall right through the crack. You know, there was um, a period where I was very angry mm -hmm. um, at, at Teresa and, and at God. You can only hold on to your anger for so long. I got angry at the illness and I got angry at the barriers to getting help. And that's where I put my focus. You know, I mean, I don't think anybody that goes through what I went through feels like you know they're cured of it you just learn to manage it i mean i still have deep dark moments to this day but i know how to cut them off since one in four of us experiences mental health issues it might be good to understand the signals so that we can help ourselves or those we love if my gut tells me that someone i love is struggling in any way that, that would indicate to me that they may have a mental illness or may be thinking about suicide, I would act immediately. Some steps that you can take are to ask them directly, don't wait. Ask them, are you thinking about suicide? Stay with them until they can get, you can get the help that they need. You can talk to them about um, what would you like us to do at this point. Do you want me to go with you to the hospital? Do you want me to call your doctor? Should we make an appointment? I'll go with you. Signs. If a person were to notice extreme behavior in an otherwise pretty peaceful child, and in her case, we noticed her withdrawing more and spending time alone. Um, sleep, her sleep patterns were off. She was not sleeping at night and sleeping a lot during the day. Um, eating patterns were disturbed. Another um, sign, I guess, would be she was cutting. Mm -hmm. Cutting, yeah, and uh, she had a couple of pretty significant cuts on her arm. Mm -hmm. Don't be afraid to seek help. When you need it, it's okay to ask for help. It's okay to, to just be yourself and know that it doesn't always have to be this way, but you have to work at it. It's not like, oh, I'm going to flip a switch and I'll be fine. It's a lot of work. It's working on your spirituality, therapy, medications, um, meditation, 
exercise, eating healthy. You know, it's like a full-time job. Do some research. Find out places that will support you. There's a lot of different mental health agencies out there that will support you. Um, there's support groups out there, NAMI Connections, and there's ways to develop support groups. Sometimes it may not be family. Maybe it's your made up family, you know, those friends that are close to you that, you know, because your family isn't ready yet to accept that you have a mental illness. Or, you know, or they feel ashamed. So the, the first step is just to, just to reach out, just share it with somebody, just let somebody know how you feel. And there's a solution. And there's, a, there's an opening of a window to a, a dimension of our life that we weren't even aware of that's causing us to behave and feel the way we feel. Go to a doctor. Um, doctors are trained to deal with everything. Um, see a professional counselor. Um, they're trained to deal with issues like this. And, and if you're like me and you go in there and you think, okay, this is going to knock this person out of their chair when I tell them what I'm going through and then it doesn't knock them out of their chair and there's a solution. If you're observing someone who is having a hard time maybe pulling out of a situational type grief because we've all experienced depression um, as routinely uh, grief and loss is a part of life so we all can understand what depression is like. It's when you can't pull out of it that it's concerning. You need to feel that you're wanted and that you that you deserve to have a life worth living. And a lot of people don't feel that way. A lot of people with mental illness uh, isolate. And our society doesn't make it easier for people to not isolate because of all the stigma out there. If every life is a sacred journey, then what are the spiritual lessons associated with mental illness? I've always felt like, um, even though I've had these suicidal thoughts, there's always been like somebody watching over me. You know, it's just the spirits surround you, you know, guardian angel, always there protecting you because I couldn't protect myself. The humbling and crazy part of this whole story was that I asked for all this. Being a, a man of faith and desiring to be a man of faith, I started to pray for purification. And that when I prayed for purity, I, I wish I could go back and, and see what his response was, kind of like, are you sure? <laughs> this might not be very fun. I mean, we all have this, this void in our lives and I needed to fill that up with my faith. You know, I needed to, to develop a relationship, a deeper relationship with God in that I speak to Him as if He is my Father and He's in the room. And prayer for me is, here's what I'm going through, I wanna share this with you, and thank you for listening, and you'll probably give me some direction at some point. The biggest thing I think for me <clears throat> is that, um, I learned that um, sometimes we have to suffer and we don't understand why things happen the way they, the way they do. But I, I trust that, that God has a reason for allowing things to happen. And so for me, it's, I, I'm, I'm seeing Christ as walking with me. And doesn't mean there's not pain. In fact, the pain sort of cracks, shatters and cracks who you thought you were. and and rec is recreated. So my journey since her death has been ex intense um, and deep and painful. So my spirituality is pretty important to me. Um, my church has a mental health ministry that I've been part of for, for several years. And um, that's important to me that my spiritual home is also welcoming and accepting of 
people living with mental illness and stuff. That, that there's no more of this shame that you have mental illness. I used to always think all life is valuable except for mine. And now I see it as all life is valuable, including mine. I mean, the healthy thing to do with suffering is to, is to just let it, let it come to you and let it be present to you and not deny it or not run from it um, or fight it. That God gives grace to people to endure what they need to endure. It means we have to put one foot in front of the other and trust that one day this pain will lessen and, and God's grace and God's goodness will come through this somehow. We had talked a little bit about things that lead up to um, being in recovery and spirituality being one, can be one, and it, I, I see it as giving that hope that, um, that even though we feel alone, we're not alone. And for some people that, that in itself is just life-saving. I also believe that um, a community of faith can be very helpful because you now have people around you and people who care. And being alone is not helpful if you're living with depression, um, if you're contemplating suicide. Certainly we don't want isolation, but that is the tendency to isolate when we're feeling depressed. So I just want to continue to live a happy life and and keep on working towards recovery and I think this is the happiest I've ever been in my life so yeah, you know it feels it feels good to be alive. So we all take our turns going through the dark night of the soul but what we found today is that some faith, some hope and some love for ourselves and for those we care about can make the difference. Thanks for watching.